We are super excited. Uh, Wilson Oscar is going to be giving the word this morning, and he's one of our elders at the church, and so his wife, Merlene, was just up here singing. And so if you don't know who he is, get to know this guy. We love this guy. So give him some love this morning, and he's going to do a great job. Good morning. Good morning. That's a lot better. God is good. God is good. God is good. And all the time. That's a lot better. I like this. You just don't know how nervous I am, though. <laughs> but it's a, it's a privilege to be standing up here this morning. All glories go to God. It's not about me. It's not about you, but it's all about the kingdom of God. That's why we have to learn to give God glory. But um, this sermon that we will be preaching this morning is about guidance. And when I started to read this passage, I've been reading it for a very, very long time. All the time I'm reading the passage, but, and sometimes God talks to you in different kind of ways. Every time you read a passage, he talks to you another kind of way. But when I wake up every day, really don't know what to do. A lot of time I'm scared, I'm afraid. I'm worried about what's coming ahead of me, what's going to happen on my way to work, or what's going to happen in the street, accident, traffic, and what's going to happen to, your, to our family. And reading Psalm 25 changed my way. And I've learned to ask God to make those words true for me every day. Also ask God to help me to put my trust in God. Not everything that's going to take place, but to trust in God. So much of my sins and bad choices, flaws, my failures, the bad things that I've done, and there's a lot of time I've tried to handle the situation or those matters myself and not learning to trust God. But reading this passage, I had to take a step back just a little bit to learn to trust on God, not just on mankind or not just on myself. We have the choice every day every day of our life, that we wake up in the morning to trust God. Every second of your life, you can trust God. Every minute that you have, you can learn to trust God. Every hour, you can learn to trust God. Every day, every week, every month, every year that comes in your life that you are breathing, you have to learn to trust God. And reading this passage, I had to understand that, what God wants for me. And he's teaching me to trust him, not no one else but God himself. The second that we have is not promised. Why? Look what happened yesterday in California. Look what happened yesterday in Plantation. So anything can happen at any time. But if you trust in God, I promise you, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. We just have to learn to guide our focus towards God. That's all he's asking us to do. So this morning, when we open our Bible together in Psalm 25, verse 1 and 5, he said, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wanton, wantonly treasures. Make me to know your way, O oh Lord. Teach me your path. Five, very important. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you 
I wait all day long. Amen? God said, for you, I wait all day long. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, I come to you this morning. Un, 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 unworthy to be standing up here, Father God, a sinner that I am. But yet, Lord, you chose me this morning for a purpose. You, you chose me this morning to talk because that's what you wanted, Father God, not me. But yet, Lord, I'm asking you to use me as a vessel this morning. And yet, Lord, use me, Father God, um, to speak your word. Father, Lord, I, Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, just to come into my heart and, and minister into my heart, Father God. And there's people that are sitting here this morning, Father, that really need your presence, that's seeking for something this morning, Lord. And let this word speak to their heart, Father, in their mind and their soul. In your name we pray. Amen. How are you guys doing this morning? God has been so good. When we open this, this book, this book that we call the book of life, and Psalm 25, we find that David... And this book is pictures, and, and its picture in the psalm has a faithful, faithful, faithful servant. David, holiness, trust in God. His many conflicts, his great transgressions, his bitter repentance, and his deep distress are all here. We see David here in this, in this, in this passage seeking after. God's heart. Because at that time, we see that David was struggling bad. But one thing, the number one thing that David said, trust. Trust is the ability to live with hope and certain time, the ability to tell us that no one who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in God, will ever be put to shame. David said if we Trust in God. Trust is the ability to live with hope. Meaning the fact that we have trust in God, we have hope one day, we will live with God forever and evermore. Because that's the person that you choose to trust on. To trust on the Lord means more than believing whom he is and what he said. The word here for trust can also mean to have confidence. Confidence on who? On God. Trust is trust in the Lord with all your heart and not learn on your own understanding. We find it in Proverbs 3 verse 5. Trust in God means that because we trust in God, we have hope, even in times of trouble, even in time of sorrow, even in times of need, even when everyone turn against you, even when your family turn against you, when your friends turn against you, you have to trust in God. A lot of us have trust in everything in the world. A lot of us have trust in the chair that we are sitting on this morning, right? Why do you talk to me, please? Why do you trust the chair that you are sitting on? Why? You trust the, the person or the man that built that chair. When you, when you sit on the chair, it's not going to break, right? You trust in the architect or the engineer that built this building. When you come to, to church and worship that the building is, is not going to clap on top of you, right? You trust in the car that you drive every day to work that, you know, when you drive in the car, it's not going to break down with you in the street. But a lot of us don't seem to trust in God, but we trust on mankind. We have faith on the chair that we are sitting on right now. We believe that the chair is not going to break when we sit on it. We have trust in our, in our boss at work that our boss is not going to fire us because we come to work every day, we never go to work late, we, we never call us sick. But I'm sorry to tell you that. Mankind can always deceive you, but God will never deceive you. The chair that you are sitting on right now 
can easily break, break, sorry, but God will never break. If you believe and trust in God, I promise you, the sorrows, the pain, the difficulty, the trials that you are going through this morning, God have your back. The only thing that you need to do is to trust in who? Should you trust on Pastor Brian? Don't be afraid to say no. I know he's going to kill me, but still. I don't want you to, talk, to trust Pastor Brian or, or the elder board or the deacons or your leaders, but God said to trust in me. That's what God says. Trust me. No one but me. We trust everything in the world. We trust the mankind, but we refuse to trust in God. Why is that? Is it because God is not physically here? And is it because when we talk to God, he's not responding to us just like I'm talking to you right now? So there's one thing we have to learn is to trust in God. Let me show a short video clip before we jump to the next um, bullet point, please. Beneath a cool facade lies insecurity, reaching the deepest part of you. Underneath everything lies failure, humiliation, rejection, worthlessness, and disgrace. A fraud waiting to be exposed. A feeling that you're dirty. At the root is shame. And for men and women, this is how it surfaces in our lives. There is no self-treatment for this quiet killer. You can't overcome it on your own. Time doesn't help, neither does confession. Because shame is just as often from what others have done to you as from what you've done yourself. But there is hope. The Bible is about shame from start to finish. If we're willing, God's beautiful words break through. Jesus cares for the shamed. Through him, they're covered, adopted, cleansed, and healed. I, I want you guys to Take a minute while I'm going to jump to the next point where we're going to talk about shame and guilt. Think a little bit about that video. Just think about that video just a minute. The next thing that David talked about, shame and guilt. There is no difference between shame and guilt. Guilt is looking at the sin. Shame is looking at yourself. Scripture hooked these two words together. In Genesis... To the, to, through the story of the fall, the first thing Adam and Eve felt after sinning was shame. They covered themselves and hide. Shame feel bad, but it's different from guilt. Shame is the painful feeling of disconnection from others that come from feeling defective. You may think you feel bad because of things you have done, but the truth is shame is a bad feeling that you have about yourself. And, and you had that feeling long before you committed any of the things you caused. Shame always push us to hide from who? From God. Isn't that what happens every day in our life? When we do something that is bad, at that moment, we need our spiritual leaders to pray for us or your accountability partner to pray with you. But a lot of times what we do, we run away. Instead of coming, we go back. Adam and Eve's glory, glorious and shame-free life did not last long. It didn't last long. Their sin and shame enters the world after eating what? Some people said, that. there you go, the fruit. Adam and Eve cover themselves with fig leaves. They do not want to be seen. They feel unworthy, embarrassed. But the number one thing Adam and Eve did was what? Disobey. Disobey. God, disobedience, God's command, 
created Shem. Before their sin, Adam and Eve were both naked, and they felt no shame. Why is that? Before they were walking in the garden naked with nothing on, it was okay. It was fine with them. Apparently, they were blind spiritually, but at the end, the moment they ate that fruit, what happened? The eyes were open. But when we look in Genesis chapter 225, but now they are naked and shame. When God walked in the garden, they hide. They sense something wrong with themselves, not just their action. They realize that, hey, I've done something wrong. I've done something wrong because now they, they realize that they're naked. They realize that they can hide from God. Isn't that the same thing we do as human beings? When we do something wrong, when we know that um, it's wrong, what we do? We hide from God. There is time in, in, in our life when we, when we sin, we don't even feel like praying. How many of you guys are like that? There is time that you feel like, I was wrong. I've committed a sin that I shouldn't, but it's, it's tough. And th these are the times where you need someone to pray with. You need someone to hold you. You need someone that you can cry in their shoulder. But a lot of time we're looking for that someone, but that someone is not there. The only person that is there is God. No one else but God. Shame is consequently a sin. Feeling guilt and shame are subject, acknowledgement, ob object that we as Christians have to learn how to stay away from. Objective spiritual reality. Guilt is judicial character. Shame is a relational thought related to guilt. Shame emphasizes and sin effect on self identity. Sinful human being are traumatized before holy God. When we sin, there is time in our life we do get traumatized, like it or not, depending on what you do. Because if you are a Christian, when you sin, if you don't feel it, if you don't feel guilty about it, if you don't feel ashamed about it, something is wrong with you. Something is wrong with you. As a Christian, when you're walking with God, when you're teaching the Word, when we're talking about teaching the word, we're not just talking about the pastor standing and, 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 and preaching. you teaching a Sunday, a Sunday school class or a life group or you're encouraging uh, somebody. How do you feel? How can you um, encourage someone when you know that you're doing the same thing they're doing or worse? You can't. But when we look in Genesis chapter 3, um, 7 and 8, then the eyes of both were open. Both were open. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves lying clothed. Eight. And they heard the sound of the Lord, God walking in the garden in the cold of the day. And the man and his wife hide themselves from the presence of the Lord, God among the trees of the garden. Again, they hide themselves because they realize that they have sinned against God. When we sin against God, we're going to hide. We don't want to talk to nobody. We don't want to see nobody. Now, we trying to, a lot of times we try to justify our sin or just hide away from everybody thinking that's, that's going to solve the problem, that's going to solve the issue, that's going to solve your sin, but no. The more you hide from God, the, the worse the matters get. The worse it gets. So therefore, when we sin, we have to understand to come to God. We have to understand to get on our knees and pray and open our Bible and start praying and start communicating with God. Because that's the only way we're going to be away. We're going to be able to stay away from the sin that we are committing. One big thing about shame is one of the enemy's greatest tactics. 
He is the accuser, the father of lies, paralyzed by guilt and shame. A, a, a believer can fall into the enemy's trap and feel chained to all called the past. Shame can emerge when the devil convinces you that you are to blame for something you had no control over. That's what the devil does. He will blame you for everything because he wants to bring you down. But one thing that I'm going to tell you this morning, though, don't allow shame or guilt to rob you for the favor and blessing of God's holiness. Do not allow God, do not allow guilt or shame to destroy your life. The devil works hard at reminding me, I'm saying me, Wilson, reminding you of things you rather forgotten. The enemy wants you to live under a condemnation and with a label of failure. That's what the enemy wants from you. You may have failed, but you are not a failure this morning. You have to understand that. There's a lot of time the devil say, you fail. But just remember that God, God never fail. Because God is always around. You may struggle with addiction, but you are not an addict this morning. You might have addiction, but that doesn't mean that you're an addict because you have God in your life. That's not your identity this morning. Because you may have been victimized in some way, but you are not a victim because you have the Holy Spirit within your life this morning. Just remember that. What people did to you does not determine who you worth this morning. What they did to you does not determine who you worth. Just remember that. You are a child of God. You will always be a child of God. No matter what people say about you, you still remain a child of God. You are approved by the Holy Spirit. You are accepted by the Holy Spirit. You are valuable to the Holy Spirit. You are an apple of God's eyes. Why would he let the devil destroy you? Why would he let the enemy destroy you when you are his child? That's who God is. You are known and adored by the king, the creator of the universe, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. That's who he is this morning. Remember, he said, I am the one who created you. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. No one cannot destroy you. But this morning, God wants you to lift your head up. And don't worry about what everyone says about you. Lift your head up and begin to speak blessing and promises over yourself. That's what we have to do. Lift your head up. Lift your head up. No matter what you're going through this morning, God wants you to lift your head up and begin to speak blessing and promise over yourself. Don't let negative event become your identity. Don't let your past mistake become who you are. You are not the guy who blew his marriage or the girl with the addiction or the parent who, who kids rebel. You are not the divorcee, the convict, the loser. Those labels cannot consume who you are this morning because you have an almighty God that you serve and he's always in control in your life. The only thing you have to do is to just trust in who? You have to trust in God. And when you trust in God, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have hard time and struggles and difficulty. They are going to come, but you don't want to let no one put a label on you that you are not this morning. Don't go by that label. You are God beloved. He's chosen one this morning. His delight, his joy, his magnificent creation. You have potential. You have a future with God. You have the power to live free, laborly free, free of the chain of guilt and shame. But what must you do? 
Trust in God. You have the power to be free. You have the power to speak blessing within your life. Instead of letting people talk bad about you. We go deep. He said, David made three appeals to God. The first thing he said on verse 4, show me your way, O Lord. Number two, he said, teach me your path. David said he is ready to learn from God. He's ready to learn everything in God's university. He said, God, I'm ready to learn from you. David said, show me, teach me, lead me. This is the attitude we must adapt towards God. Asking God to teach us. Asking God to lead us. That's what we have to do. That's the, that's the thing we have to adapt. Do we really, and as Christian, do we really want to be taught by God? Do we want to know the way of the Lord? Do we want God to lead us through his life? Do we really want that? Do we really want that? A lot of us that are sitting here does not want God to teach us unless it's what we want. A lot of us don't want that. We, we don't want God to teach us. We don't want God to lead us. We want to do things our own way. That's Wilson. But let's look at another passage. And, and there's number four again. It says, show me your way, O Lord. Teach me thy path. Teach me thy way. David is petitioning to God right now. He's telling God, this is what I want from you, God. Jesus is the way. He is the bright and shining light that we are to follow. The way is very, very narrow. God's way is not a right path like 75 or I-95 or the Palmetto that we could speed on. And sometimes there are obstacles in God's ways. Because sometimes when you're walking with God, it's not always going to be easy. It's very narrow. There's obstacles. But one thing, David is saying, get your eyes off the obstacles and the fact that the path is narrow, fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the light. Follow his light, his path. That's what he wants. To trust God, there is time that's going to come. More often, let's look at John 8, verse 12. He said, then spoke Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light, the world. He that followed me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light. Ephesians 5, 8, for he was sometime dark, but now light, and Lord walk as children of light. More often, as Christian, we only want God to lead us if he's leading where we want to go. We, we only want God to lead us where we want, where, where we want to go. We only want to see the way we want to go. That, 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 that's just how it is. We only want to be taught what we want to learn and be, be led in, in the direction that we think is best for us. That's, that, that's what we do. But this is not trusting in God and it's not giving our life to God. David says that he will wait for the Lord all day long. For you to know God, while David is speaking, he's saying, teach me, lead me. There is time to get to that dimension when, I'm, I'm sure at that time David was, was struggling a whole lot. He sinned, he's petitioning to God. At that path, that path that he talks about here, he said it's very narrow. At the same time, it's muddy. At the same time, it's slippery. At the same time, there are, there are mountains for you to climb. At the same time, there, there are rivers you have to cross over to get to the level where you want to get with God. Because guess what? If it's easy for you, you're not going to understand God. You're not going to see the glory of God. So sometimes you are going to fall. But David doesn't say he stays there. When you fall, what you do? It's raining and it's muddy. You're running, you fall. You don't stay in the mud. You get up 
and you keep on rocking. Sometimes when you're climbing the mountain, it's very difficult. Sometimes you hang and hang and no one to help you. But just remember that there is a God. When you fall, that will hold your hand and pick you up. Just remember when you need to cross that river, because you need to trust and believe in God, someone will get you across one way or the other, because the Holy Spirit will not leave you behind. He will not leave you behind. But a lot of time, when we go to verse 5, he says, again, he's repeating the same thing back on verse 4. Leave me in that, in that truth and teach me. He's saying it over and over again, just like a baby. I have four of them, so. Just like a baby starting to learn how to walk, holding, holding on to his parents, his mother, or his father's hand. And to be further instructed in alphabets of truth, experimental teaching. Because now the baby is learning everything from scratch. They don't know how to crawl. They don't know how to walk. And at times, it's so cute when you're holding your little baby hand like this. You're just walking with that little baby. Those of you who have babies know exactly what I'm talking about. You have to teach the baby everything. Whatever you tell the baby, that's what the baby goes by. But us as Christians, we don't go by that at times. At times, it is a burden of, of prayer because we don't pray enough. We don't spend time with God enough. But David said, lead me according to your truth, O God. According to your truth, O God. Lead me. How many of us, when we're praying, really say, God, please lead me. Please teach me. A lot of us don't do that. Because we want things our own way. And David says, and prove thyself. Faithfully, lead me into truth that I may know its preciousness. Lead me by the way of truth that I may manifest its spiritual with you, God. Your spiritual with you, God. David knew much, but he felt his ignorance and desire to be still in the Lord's school. Four times he repeated that. He said, Lord, please teach me, lead me. He kept Repeating it over and over again. Because at that time when David committed the sin, he knew there was no way out of it but through God. He knew that. But how many of us today know for a fact there's no way out? We all have things that we struggle with. We all have difficult moments that we go through. We all have trials. We all go through the valley at times where, where we have no way out. We all have a path that we fall down and through. But God wants to tell you this morning, what path are you on this morning? I'm going to give you a few examples. First Peter 5, 8 say, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, he said, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy is who? The devil. Prowl around like a Worrying, lying, looking for someone to do what? To devour. Why? The devil's job, guys, is to destroy you, to bring you down. That's his job. But just remember, we have a heavenly father who's always fighting for your battles. And there's a song, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm not a worship leader. It's a God will make a way. Where there seems to be no way, he works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way. He will make a way. God will always make a way. Where there seems to be no way. At times, I don't understand it. At times, I don't see it. But I have to learn there is time I sing that song over and over again in my head. I say, God, you say you're going to make a way for me. Where is the way? I don't see it. But God already sees it. Because he's the one leading me. Are you letting God lead you this morning? That's what David is telling us, telling me. Teach me, lead me. 
John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all sin. Just, we have a few practicals uh, for you this morning. One thing that I can encourage you this morning, when it comes to, to knowing God, where we, we just show a few practical verses, and, and Psalm 23, verse, um, especially 3 and 5, it tells us that righteousness, glory, we're going to have the difficulty, humble, we're going to fall, we have also have to be humble, you know, but when we fall, we, we have to learn how to get up. Struggles are, are going to come our way. Of, we're going to have financial difficulty. We're going to have family issues. But that doesn't mean that for us not to ask God to lead us and, and to teach us. If I would ask this morning, we, we done. How many of you guys are going through some hard time? I'm sure every one of us would, we would raise our hand. It might not be finance. It might be sickness. It might be your job. It might be your kids. It might be your family member. Every single one of us is going through something this morning. But I want to encourage you to stay in God's path this morning. If you keep that path, you are going to struggle because God's path is, is very, very, very narrow. But you will get there and God will deliver you when you get there. Some application. One of the number one thing that we have to learn how to do is to trust in God. Because when you trust in God, he will not disappoint you. He will not. And God, goodness, uprightness, faithfulness, steadfast love, shown to those who are humble and keep his covenant. That's what God is. And three, and see the blessing we receive now because we're going to put our trust in God. No matter what we go through, no matter what it is, we will learn to trust in God. While Jonah and the team come out, if any of you guys feel like there is something that you are struggling with, you, you, you need prayers. We do have um, um, our, our elders, or deacon, the leaders, they, they're always ready to, to pray with you. Because there is time in our life, I need prayer. I know there's time in your life that you need prayer. So there is something that you're struggling with or you're having, a, you're having a hard time with. You don't know what to do anymore. Why don't we go to God in prayer and ask God, show me. Just like, just like David said, I'm going to read the verse while they're coming out just one more time. So you could marinate. Just like when you're seasoning a meat, you know, you have sometimes, sometimes you have to put, put the meat in the marinade so it could taste real good. It says, show me your way, O Lord. Teach me thy path. Teach me thy path, O God. Show me your way. You got to ask God to show you the way and to teach you his word so you can get closer to God this morning. May God bless you. Thank you.